round of applause for uh, DJ Mushu. So I, I, I heard you have an upcoming gig. Yeah, no, I got a gig overseas, so. Uh, overseas? I'm playing in France. Just quiet, quiet. You're, we're going where? I'm playing in uh, France. I'm going to Paris, Cannes, Nice. So you, you have shows lined up in Paris and Nice? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did that happen? Uh, actually, I don't want to get into, get into too much, but connection. Let's just say that. Like stuff? Like tour? Again, not going to get into okay. Okay. All right. Congrats. I mean, is this is it a legal show or like? Okay. And no, it's not illegal. It's just. It's, it's not, not illegal, legal, but it's. It's, it's not illegal, but not should be, should not be happening. That. That's good. Okay. All right. Awesome. Hey, Andrew. What? Speaking of upcoming gigs, do I get <laughs> for the spring version of 445? So Charlie's asking whether he gets the spring version, whether he gets his own <laughs> for the spring version of 445. <laughs> DJ Mushu? <laughs> I mean, if he gets arrested overseas, no, right? Like that's, <laughs> we can take that one offline. Okay. Um, all right, so for you guys in the class, uh, homework two will be due uh, September 25th, and then project one will be due October 2nd. Again, as I posted on Piazza last night, there will be a info session on this Thursday at 8 p.m. over, over Zoom, and the, the link is in Piazza. And then we'll have the sort of extra special office hours on Saturday, uh, 3 p.m., 5 p.m., and that'll be on Gates. And also there's a post on Piazza for this. Any questions about homework two or project one? All right, and then we'll release the, uh, if we haven't yet, we'll release the answers to uh, homework one uh, in a bit, or uh, today or tomorrow. All right, some other talks that are coming up that you guys might be aware about that I think will be kind of interesting. So again, we have our Monday talks from, from people in industry. Uh, so next week we have uh, the, the guys from Rockset talking about their database system. So Rockset was founded by the guys that built RocksDB at Facebook and they forked it off and built a, uh, a new analytical engine based, based on it. The, there's somebody from Yandex coming to talk about uh, the Odyssey proxy. Uh, we'll talk about proxies later in the semester when we talk about distributed databases. Just think of this as something that sits in front of Postgres and handles incoming connections and can, can do connection pooling. And then uh, on October 10th, uh, we'll have a developer from fly.io talk about Lightstream, which is a uh, version of SQLite that can read and write to S3 files on, on AWS. See, if you, have, if you pay attention to Hacker News, uh, the SQLite's kind of the hot, hot database now. Like there's sort of trends. Postgres is still the hot one. SQLite's the hot one as well. So there's the fly IGOs are invested in this pretty heavily. So where we're at in the semester is that we're continuing to go up the stack in our database system and in our architecture. And you know, we talked about how we store pages on disk. We talked about how to manage things in memory. And now we're at this level here in the middle where we're going to sort of have the intersection between the pages that are in the buffer pool and the execution engine. And so these are going to be called access methods, right? Because it's, it's the methods that the database system uses to access data. Um, and so for the next two classes, we're going to talk about the two main data structures we're going to have in our database system that we can build on top of our, our tables. And that's going to be hash tables and trees. Uh, so today we'll be at hash tables uh, because we'll need this for, we could use these for table indexes, but we're also going to use these for auxiliary data structures like you saw in the page table you're building for project one. Uh, we'll use these for joins and a whole bunch of other things in the database system. And then on uh, Thursday, we'll talk about B plus trees, which is the best data structure ever, ever built. Uh, which is that, what, what was that, sorry? I thought splay trees were best. Splay trees are best? Yeah. You, <laughs> you can go talk to Danny Slate about that. I, I know of no database system that uses a, a splay tree. Okay? I, uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, I can't talk about later right now because we're recorded, but like, we'll deal with that later. Uh, <laughs> He's, he's a good guy. He's a good guy. All right. So again, we'll talk about hash tables and and and, and B plus trees on Tuesday. Okay. And then we'll have these you know these different data structures are gonna have different trade offs, uh, and they're gonna be, we're gonna use them in different circumstances inside of our database system. And again, I realize a lot of you, most of you, all of you should have taken an algorithms course. Uh, and so the everyone should know what a hash table is at a high level. But the the thing that's gonna differ in our discussion today and our tree discussion on on Thursday is how we're going to use them in a database system where we care about sequential reads versus you know, random reads, 
where we care about uh, organizing data in four kilobyte pages or so forth, right? That's been slightly different than how you maybe think about uh, things than before. Yes. Thursday. What is today? Tuesday? Okay. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I thought you said Tuesday. I was like, that's after the homework, too. Uh, no, it's this, this Thursday. Cool. Yeah. All right. So these data structures, again, whether it's tree or hash table, to be used throughout, th throughout all the, the, the different database system. A bunch of these we've covered already, like internal metadata. We talked about using this uh, hash table for a page table in the buffer pool. We can use this for core data storage, like the, storing the tables themselves. We can see this, we'll see this in B plus trees where the actual leaf nodes of the tree could actually be the tuples themselves. Uh, there are certainly database systems that store the tuples inside the, the value portion of a hash table. We can use these for temporary data structures, like if, if we're trying to run a query uh, and if we realize, hey, it'd be really nice if we had a hash table or B plus tree right now to make this query run faster, we could build it on the fly, use it for that one query, and then immediately throw it away. Uh, and then of course, obviously, we use them for table indexes. Like, think of the glossary in a textbook that you jump to in individual pages based on keywords, right? So again, these data structures are going to be all th used all throughout the, the system. And then sometimes we're going to care about uh, parallelism. Sometimes we're going to care about uh, durability and recoverability, right? And there's different trade-offs we can make how we how based on what data structure we want to use for different the different circumstances. So the the sort of Okay, this, I mean, this is what I meant, like I said. The, the, the main two design decisions we're going to have in our, when we choose a data structure is how we're going to organize the data in either in memory or in pages that we want to write out on the disk. And we don't do this in a way that is going to be the most efficient, uh, have the most efficient access uh, capabilities for the, the particular use that we're, you know, the use case that we're using for our system, right? So for now, we're going to mostly talk about single threaded access. Next week, we'll talk about multi-threaded B plus trees, and we'll sprinkle a little bit of discussion in today about how, how to handle multiple threads accessing our hash tables. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll focus on a lot of that la later on. Um, and things are going to be tricky when you have uh, when you use these data structures for indexes because not only can you have threads accessing the physical contents at the same time, you could have threads modifying the logical contents at the same time. And that may not, may not make sense right now, but when, you see, when we talk about transactions, you'll understand what I mean. Um, and so again, how we actually handle multiple threads, doing operations, doing things on our data structures, and accessing at the same time, is is going to be is going to one of the things we have to keep in back of our mind as we go forward. All right. So again, so the the definition of a hash table should not be new to anyone here, but the high level idea is that it's going to be a honest, unordered associated array that's going to map keys to values. We don't care what, care what the keys are. We don't care what the values are. Other than to make our lives easier, we're going to assume that the combination of a key and value together will be fixed length because it makes things uh, a lot easier for us. And there's going to be some hash function that's going to be that we'll have specified for a hash table where we're going to use that to compute an offset into this array that allows us to jump to the particular key value pair that we're looking for. Now, it's not always going to be direct mapping, right? The hash function may take us to a location in this array that may not actually have the data that we're looking for, but it's at least going to get us in the, in the right location. And then we can do some extra steps to look around and try to find, uh, find what we actually need. Right? We can do a little extra work to figure out, does the thing we're looking for actually exist or not? The, uh, the space complexity for what we're going to have for our, our hash table is going to be O n, where n is the number of keys that we actually want to store. We're going to see in practice, though, the, in, the, actual, the actual space complexity is going to be actually 2 to, th two to 4 n. Because we may actually allocate two to four extra, uh, times extra space for the number of keys that we should want to have, again, based on what hashing scheme that we're actually using. But on paper, it's n. And the different, screen, the different schemes are going to have different trade-offs for how they're going to handle collisions. The time complexity for our operations are, on average, it's going to be O1. And then worst case scenario, it would be ON. Meaning we have to do a linear scan looking at every, every, single, uh, every single key. So again, if you're coming from an algorithms course, uh, this all sounds fantastic, right? Because you know they're worried about exponential or polynomial time, and here we're saying we can do things in average case O1. But I will say in practice, though, in the world of databases, we care about constants, right? So even though it's O1, if we can shave off a couple of milliseconds for each operation that we're doing, that's going to be a huge win for us. In their world, we don't care. We we make money. We care, right? Um, so. 
you know, so so the we'll see in different situations, and as we talk as we go along, there may be a good trade-off where we can do a little extra storage, may pay a little extra in the storage overhead to get reduced computational cost for the operations that, that we want to do. Okay. All right, so let's talk about the, the, the simplest hash table you could ever possibly build. Right? It's just a giant array that we malloc in memory, and we ignore about storing things on disk for now. Uh, and then we're going to have one slot in this array that's gonna, uh, that we use for every single element that we want to store. So the only thing we need to do now is we want to find, the, uh, we find a particular key that we want. Uh, we would just take the key that we want, hash it, modify the number of slots that we have, and that's going to give us a pointer to some additional storage. We're not defining what that is just yet. That's going to have our have the, the key value pair that we want, right? So the simplest thing, the simplest thing, we take some hash function. We don't define what it is yet. Take the key, uh, run the hash function. That's going to produce some new integer. We mod by by n, and then we jump to right where we want to be, right? What's the problem with this? Yes. He says you only want one slot per value. Uh, yeah, so so yeah, we could assume that there's only one there's one slot per key, and so we have to know the number of keys we have ahead of time to to, to map exactly to this. What are some other problems? I heard collisions, yeah. right? So we're assuming that there's no no possible collisions that every key is unique, and after hashing it, we get we get a unique value or a unique hash location, right? So. We basically covered all this, right? So every key is unique. We know the number of keys ahead of time, and it's fixed. Meaning, like, they say, hey, here's your 1 million keys. I'm never going to take any away. I'm never going to add any more. So go, go to town, right? And then we're also assuming that we have what is called a perfect hash function. Meaning for every single key that we give it, the, the hash function is guaranteed to produce a unique hash value. Does this exist in practice? No, right? It's in the, in the theory, right? There's theoretical literature that discusses, hey, you, you could build a theoretical, you could, could build a perfect hash function this way. But when you actually read how they do it, they, they use a hash table, right? So you basically need a hash table for your hash function for your hash table, right? Uh, so that's why nobody would do this in practice. Um, so, so this approach is unrealistic, right? So we, we, we're not always going to know exactly the number of keys that we're going to have. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Uh, we're not guaranteed that every key is going to be unique. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. Uh, and we're definitely never going to have a perfect hash function. So the design decision we have to have when we choose a hash table for our database is going to be come down to two choices. The first is going to be what is the hash function we want to use, right? And it's again, some, some function where we take some arbitrary key and then we're going to map it into a, a smaller domain of integers. Uh, that's and we'll lose any sort of notion of, um, of order preservation to, to the key to the, to the hash value, but that's okay. And of course, there's going to be this trade-off between how fast we, our hash function can be versus our collision rate. What's the fastest hash function you could ever build? Identity. He says identity. Uh, e even faster. Constant. constant what? Yeah, what's the constant value? One. one, exactly, yes. No matter what key you give me, I'm going to give you back one. It's going to be super fast. But the collision rates can be terrible, right? So, but then the other extreme would be the perfect hash function, where, I, again, I do all this extra extra lookups, but then I can guarantee that I'm going to give you a unique hash value. So we want to be somewhere in, in the middle, right? The next choice we have to make is the hashing scheme, and this is going to determine what the what the hash table, how the hash table is going to handle collisions, right? Because we can't assume that for a given hash value that there's not going to be, or you know, hash value there's not going to be any collisions. And we're going to land into a, a slot in our, our in our array that's going to be unoccupied. We can't guarantee that. So the question is, how do we actually deal with that, that those scenarios? And of course, there's going to be another trade-off between how large we want to pre-allocate our hash table versus uh, the additional instructions, additional steps we have to do when we have a collision. If I allocate an infinite size array, I will never have a collision, or un very unlikely I have, have a collision. But of course, that's not realistic. So how do we deal with our constrained environment? So the combination of these two decisions is essentially what's going to make a hash table or how, how we're going to define a hash table for us in our system. So the, today's lecture is about, again, how do you build a hash table to solve all these problems that we talked about? So the first thing we're going to talk about is hash functions. Um, and I'll basically talk about here's what the state-of-the-art 
uh, algorithms or state-of-the-art functions that exist, implementations. Uh, I don't care about building one. Database people, people usually don't care about building one. You take whatever the fastest one and just use that. A lot of the old databases that came out in the 80s and, and 90s, they implement their own hash functions. Nowadays, there's very good open source implementations. And we, we just want to use those. Actually, spoiler, they don't know what the fastest one is or the best one that everyone uses today. It is not SHA-256. It is not SHA-256, no. We'll talk about why we don't want to use that. So it's actually Facebook's uh, uh, XX, XX hash, right? Uh, so the same guy that did Z standard, that compression algorithm I said before, he has a hash function, we'll see in a second, that crushes everything right now. And it's, it, in my opinion, it's still state of the art. All right, so uh, again, for okay, so the, the, the hashing schemes, and so static hashing and dynamic hashing. So static hashing would be if you know that the, the number of elements is fixed uh, in your slot array, uh, and then dynamic hashing would be you can incrementally uh, grow and shrink the size of the hash table uh, as needed, okay? All right, so hash function. Again, as I said, it's a function that given some arbitrary key of any, any length, we don't care what it is, we're going to return back an integer, either 32 or 64 bits, that's going to represent that key, right? As I said, the fastest hash function you can have is just return always one, uh, but in practice, that would be bad. So he brought up SHA-256, which, which is part of this sort of class of uh, uh, cryptographic functions called SHA-2. We don't want to use this. We don't care about this. We don't care about cryptographic properties uh, in our hash function because we're building this hash table internally inside our system. We don't care about leaking keys or anything like that, right? No one's ever going to see this, this data on the outside. This is something that we're going to build internally in our system. So we don't want to pay the uh, computational overhead to use something very expensive like, like SHA-256. We want to we use something that's faster. Yes? So this is that someone's asked, always asked oh, someone always asks this every year. Do I care about denial of service where someone could could uh, could basically skew the keys in a certain way that would then cause them to have a huge collision rate and therefore blow up the computation overhead of the system? No, because uh, if the database system is doing this internally, uh, it's assumed that whoever's using it is a, is has should have to, should has access correct access to the system so like from amazon's or google whoever the, the data vendor is perspective if you load data set that you've set up to make it have this huge collision rate they don't care because then you're going to pay the computational overhead like you're they're charging you for the resources they'll gladly take your money if you try to do something screwy like that right so th since we're not giving like raw access to to the database system to anyone we don't care about this All right, so again, we want something that, has, that is fast and has a low collision rate. So this is just a smattering of sort of the, the, the what these hash functions, you know, some, some, some of the more common hash functions that are out there. So CRC goes back to the 1970s, used for networking. There's now, uh, in modern CPUs, you can get uh, CRC instructions. So sometimes you see some systems use these. Uh, but the, so the modern era of hash functions, I think, came around in 2008. Again, this is from a non-cryptographic or non-hash function uh, researcher. This is my perspective in, in databases. So there's some random guy on the internet decided, hey, I'm going to build my own hash function. and put it out in GitHub. Uh, and then people started using it. It turned out really good. And it was designed to be this like, sort of fast general purpose hash function that you could use for you know, any possible domain. But then, then the database people picked up and started using it. Um, the uh, Google did a fork of Merver Hash in 2011, uh, and they designed City Hash to be better for f faster and shorter keys. Uh, XX Hash, as I said, is the, the state. Well, this, this is the state of the art one. This is from the same guy that did Z standard compression. I think they're up to XX, XX Hash three, which again is like uh, really fast. And then Farm Hash is uh, an extension of City Hash that has uh, designed to have better collision rates. I think there's also highway hash from Google, uh, but that's for like cryptographic stuff. We don't care about that, like cryptographic analysis. Um, so uh, there's like, there's another like CL hash function that has like relies on like new hardware instructions from Intel. In general, that that's uh, XX hash is, is the way to go. So this is just a quick benchmark that I ran, uh, you know, on my, my personal machine. Uh, Folks from this guy, he, he had some some benchmarking for he had on GitHub, um, and I just want to show you here just the level of difference in performance. 
So the, the y-axis here is the number of uh, keys per second or bit, bytes per second this thing can, uh, these different functions could hash. Um, so the bottom one is, is member hash. The red one's, I think, what you guys are using for project one, SCD hash. But if we ever bust up not high performance, we don't care about, care about that. And then the green line here is just showing you XX hash three. It's just, this is an older version even. I mean, like, the newer version might be even better, but like, it just crushes everything else. Um, you might know why there's like a sawtooth pattern uh, where like it sort of goes up and goes back down. Is it because it's expanding the size of the hash table? So that has nothing to do with hash table here. This is just like taking raw bytes. How fast can you, can you hash it? Yes? So if you're less than, your max, it's like say you're less than 64, like if you're 48, does it just zero pass? Or? Yeah, so he's, he's, he points it out, yes. So the, it's, in order to be uh, cache line aligned, or, you know, you want to make sure that you're, you're exactly like, you know, the, up to 64 or, or 128 bits. So they pad it out. So, so that's discounted in this calculation here. That's why it sort of goes up and it goes back down, right? Um, but it's interesting, again, the, the XX hash 3 crushes everything, even the larger sizes, but even the smaller ones, it's, it's still better. So again, this is my opinion, my opinion, this is the right way to go. Um, city and farm hash don't use SIMD or vectorization instructions because uh, they said this hurts portability. I forget. I, I don't know, I, I think XX hash three uses uh, SIMD, and that's part of the reason why they're getting better performance. Yes? So does using like a faster hash function or adding this performance, like using a faster hash function theoretically would create a trade off of like more colors in some circumstances? So his, que so, no, his, so his question is, uh, is user, using a hash hash ha faster hash function always the best thing to do because there's a trade off between collisions and, and performance, as I said? Return one is always the fastest hash function, but its collision rates be terrible, right? Uh, so yeah, I'm just showing performance here. A great segue to what you're talking about is uh, there's this, this this open source benchmark from the guy that does murmur hash. So in the same way, I think I'm obsessed about databases. This guy's obsessed about hashing functions, which is fantastic. Um, so he has on this is this is I mean, this page is huge. He has every single hash function he knows about, and he puts in this this benchmark framework, and he ranks them in terms of like their throughput, which I'm showing here, and their and their collision rate. Right, so, so how do you say this? His results show that XX and hash three, again, in my opinion, has the right balance between collision and, and performance. Yes? But the metrics here, are they, are they enough, do you think, or they should have other metrics to judge the hash function? His question is, uh, is like, this guy's metric, is this, is this enough to determine the quality of a hash function? If you really care about hash functions, maybe, I don't know. But from my perspective, from a database, yes. And the answer I'm telling you is just use XX hash three, yeah. right? Like, like that's it. Like that's, that's the end of the discussion. Use XX hash three. But I'm just saying there's different trade-offs to these different things. Uh, Postgres, I think, rolls their own hash function, uh, I think, still. Um, I don't know what my SQL does. I think SQLite rolls their own. But if you're building a new system today, and a lot of the newer ones just use XX, XX hash three, OK? All right, so that's it for hash functions. There's one, yes. You know, so his question is, are these, it's not just XX hash three or XX hash, like it's entity. Like are they operating on strings or are they operating on any binary data? It's just binary data. They don't know, they don't care. They don't know they don't care, okay. right? Whatever binary input and you get an integer as output. And it makes sense from, from a database system perspective because we talked about how we represent different values. It's just bits. We just throw bits at it. Okay. Uh, so first thing, again, so first thing we're going to talk about is static hashing, and this is where we're going to, so we're going to have to specify the, the number of potential locations we want to store in a hash table ahead of time, and then we'll talk about dynamic hashing where we can allow the hash table to grow and shrink to support more and, and less keys over time, right? So we're going to start off with linear probe hashing, and I apologize ahead of time. So there's linear probe hashing, and there's also linear hashing. They're different. Uh, the linear hashing will be a, a dynamic scheme. Linear probe hashing is a static scheme, and it's the most common one. So we're going to start with this. And then we're talking about Robinhood hashing and Cuckoo hashing, which will be variants of, uh, of linear probe hashing. The spoiler is going to be most systems are going to implement, most data systems are going to implement linear probe hashing because uh, it's going to be just super fast, right? All right, so 
Uh, Linear probe hashing also thought, I don't, the textbook might call this open address hashing. I, I, I double check. But sometimes you'll see it called open address hashing in, in, in different systems. Uh, and the idea is basically that the, the actual address of a key may not be the address that's specified by the hash function, right? So it's, it's sort of allowed to, to float around. So this is why it's called open addressing. Well, let's say also, too, if you, you know, when you get a, a dictionary in Python, uh, you're, you're essentially getting this hash table like this, right? It's, it's unordered. Um, so the way it's going to work is it's this giant table of slots, and we're going to hash our, our key, modify the number of slots, with that, which, since we know, that, we know the number ahead of time, and then that's going to jump to some location in the array. And then if we land in a location and it's empty, then it's ours, we put our key in, and we're done. But if we land in it and something else is in there, meaning we have a collision now, then we're going to scan through in one, you know, one, one slot after another in linear fashion, so looking for the next free slot. And once we find one, we can put our key in there. If we reach the bottom uh, and there's no free slots, then we loop back to the top and start over. So you can think of this array as a giant circular buffer, right? And so if we now keep scanning and we don't find a free slot, then the, the, tr the table's full. And so the only way to then now to handle that is that you basically take a latch on the entire data structure, the entire hash table, allocate a new, 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 new hash table that's double the size as the previous one, and then rehash everything and put it over there. All right? Yes? Do we care as long as there are values, or do we try to hash the values again to see if we are uh, having some other key? So your question is what, sorry? Yes. We scan the table as uh, long as we see values, like until we have some more of uh, that. Or uh, isn't there some risk that we reach another key and we start to scan values that are not given to us again? Uh, so his question is, um, I'll, I'll do an example. His question is, if I, as I'm scanning along, will I end up seeing keys that aren't related to what I need? Yes. And, th th and that's the trade-off we're making. Yes. That's why, again, it's 01 if we land exactly to what we want, best case scenario. Worst case scenario, we have to scan everything, n, right? All right, so let's say we want to insert all these keys, a, a through f. So the first one, the table is empty. So we hash uh, key a, mod it by the number of slots that we have, and it's empty, so we can go put our, 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 our value in. So now the contents is going to be the key and the value. We always need to store the original key because we need to determine whether the thing we're looking for is actually the, the thing we're, you know, in, in, in a given slot, right? And again, the, the key value pair has to be uh, fixed length because when we now hash mod n, it's just simple arithmetic to jump to the location that we want. So that's why it has to be fixed length. It's similar to that dictionary compression stuff that we talked about before. All right, b, same thing. I hash b mod n. I land at this, lo this location, store, store my key value pair. But then now I get to c. When I hash that, it lands on this slot, but that's already occupied by a. So all I need to do is just jump down to the next location, the next free slot that I find, and put C there. All right? Same thing with D. D is where C wants to go, but it can't go there. So then we jump to the ne next location, put it, put it below. E wants to go where A is, but it can't. So we just keep going down until we find the next free slot. Likewise, F wants to go here. We just jump down like that. If we had an addition, another additional value that way we wanted to go where F wants to go, then we would just loop, loop back around uh, and start from the stop. Right? P yes? Uh, when you're inserting something, is it guaranteed that the one that started is the place, or is that a the, Your question is, when I'm inserting something, is it guaranteed that the, uh, the, the, this pointer here is going to jump to a particular location? Yeah, is it going to start from a fixed place, like, uh, or is it just, it'll just pick any place, and then it'll start from something else? No, no, it's defined by the hash function. So the hash function gives me a random integer, right? And I modify the number of slots, and, that, and then I know how big the slots are, and I do math to jump there. Yes? So uh, two questions. One is that the search will stop only if you either find the key, or you find an empty location, or you reach the end of the whole table, right? So this question is, the search stops when you either fi uh, find the key. You find the key that you want, yes, or? Find the empty location in the linear. Right, find the empty location, meaning like you know the thing you look for it can't be there. Or you actually loop back around and you start and you, you come back to your starting location. Because okay. then you know you've scanned everything, the table's full, and the thing you want isn't there. Okay. Right? Do you have a question as well? Or? Oh, that's all. Okay.
Right, pretty straightforward. Deletes make this hard, though. And I would say also, too, uh, before we jump to deletes, I'm not showing, uh, this is just assume this is in memory. So I'm not showing page boundaries. I'm not showing that how this is actually broken up. And we, we, you know, we, we, we may write this out to disk and so forth. You can imagine easily you know, chunking this up to eight kilobyte pages, right? And you have so many slots per page. You just know how to do this, the same simple arithmetic we talked about before, how to jump to the right page offset. All right, so let's see how we want to handle deletes. So I want to delete C. So again, I, I hash the hash C mod n. That takes me to where a uh, where a is. I see that C is not equal to a, so I know this isn't the key that I want. I jump down to the next location. Waha, voila! I see C, uh, and that's that's what I want, right? So I go ahead and delete it. What happens now? Is this good or bad? Yes. So yeah, so the same is if I look for if I look for say D, D would would uh, map here, and I find an empty slot. And again, my protocol says if I see an empty slot and I haven't found the key that I'm looking for, then the key is not there. So I would get a false negative in this in this case here. Right. So how do we want to handle this? Well, uh, the first approach is just to do movement. I basically take all the keys that came after the C that we deleted here. And just slide them up. I mean, this is a way oversimplification, but basically what you do is you would look, look at all the keys that came after the thing you deleted, and rehash them, and then put them back in, uh, or you know, essentially delete them and put them back in. All right. So then now, when I want to do get C or get D, I would find the thing that I'm looking for. Is this a good idea or a bad idea? Bad. Yeah. Well, it says nobody actually does this. So yeah, but why? Right, so he says it's too costly to move all the elements. Exactly right. Yeah, so it may be the case that what, what you would actually want to do is, you know you delete it here, so you're going to find all the things that came, uh, scan down all the keys until you get to the next empty space, which would be way back up here, and you got to de you know, delete them and put them back in. And that's become very costly because, again, you have to protect this data structure with a latch, or these pages could be out in disk, and now you got to go fetch them in and then insert them back in, right? So... As I said, nobody in practice does this. The B one you made me you made it slide down as well, right? So the, the better approach from what most systems do, uh, if you're going to support deletes in your data in your hash table, which again some hash tables don't need to do deletes at all, so we don't have to worry about this. But if you do, this this is the this is the most common technique. So now what we're going to do is instead of actually removing the the, the physically removing the key that we deleted, we're just going to logically delete it. So what I mean by that is, uh, instead of actually putting an empty space here where, C, where we're deleting C, we're going to put this little tombstone marker in, in that slot. And that tells anybody else that comes along next that's looking inside this, this the hash table that, yes, that there, there used to be a tuple here, but logically it's not. So therefore, I can treat it as if it is occupied and then keep scanning if I'm looking for something. But I, I know that the, the, you know, I can ignore any of the bits that, that are actually in there. So now if anybody goes, does a lookup for C again, even though it may land here, that's where C used to be, the bits still might be there, but we don't care. We, we see the tombstone and we say we, we can ignore anything else. All right? And then now later on, someone might come along, you know, you say do a lookup in D, sees the tombstone, skips that, goes down like before. Now someone might come along and, and want to store G, and G hashes to where C used to be, and we see the tombstone and say, aha, okay, well, I can just, I'll take that over and put, 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 put G there. And that doesn't require us to do anything down below for any of the other uh, the keys. The linear hashing scheme still works correctly. Right? Yes? So in reality, how do you represent the tombstone without? This question is, how do you represent a tombstone without what? Uh, you would store an extra bit in the header, right? With a byte of line, so maybe may, may an extra byte. Yes? Uh, do you store the, the extra bit as a bit match as some metadata? Otherwise, you are having fragmentation uh, a lot of code. So his question is, do I store the bit as uh, like the... the no, if, if you are storing a, a 64-bit integer here and you are having a single extra bit here, it, it will always like, say at least a... Uh, 
So, so, yeah, so his question is, how would I actually store the tombstone? Uh, your concern is that I would actually store an extra byte per key? Yes. Does that matter? I think that matters. I have a billion keys, right? And like, the keys are huge. And so, yeah, it, it's, not, it's, non -tr it's, not, it's not trivial, but relative to the size of the data, it's usually much smaller. Because I, I, I have to store the key and the value. Yeah, that's a key here. Okay. Yeah. Again, there's, it, it could be like this, the slot array approach. If you organize those pages, you could have a bitmap in the header of the page, right, for all the, the slots that you have. So not, now maybe not storing a byte per entry. Now it's, it's a, a byte per page. And so it's, it's, it's not that big of a deal. Yes? So his question is, how does a page layout that we're backed by disk disk pages? How does that make it harder to do this, this hash table here? Uh, like before, you mentioned like the eight kilobytes like page structure in the database. Yeah. Yes. All right. So I'm just like I'm not defining here how this is actually being organized, like, like physically. Oh. Meaning, like for simplicity, just assume I malloc the giant thing, right? But it may be the case I I want, I want this to be backed by disk. Because I may want to have some part of the hash table in memory and some, and some on disk. So therefore, I want to organize, I have to organize it in pages because that's how we do things in the buffer pool, the, the, the disk manager. So what I was just saying is that like, it, it may be the case that like, you have eight slots per page or something like that. And then and that's, so when you go get a single slot, you, you're actually giving the whole page and has other slots in it. Oh. It's the same story, stuff we talked about before. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like within the logical abstraction. Like that. The logical it doesn't matter for now. And then his, his statement is like, okay, if I'm storing a tombstone for empty slot, isn't that wasted space? Uh, and the way to amortize that or deal with that is like, instead of storing a byte per entry per slot, you can store a bit per, per page, or you have a bit map per page. Now I have a bit per slot. And it's not that, it's not that much overhead. All right, so the one thing we have to talk about though, that I guarantee the algorithms class doesn't talk about is how do you store non-unique keys? Right, and this is definitely going to come up when we do start doing uh, using hash tables for joins. So there's two basic approaches to this. The first is that you have a separate linked list, where in your uh, in your hash table for a given key, you would have a pointer to some some other auxiliary data structure like a linked list uh, that's going to have all the values that correspond to that given key. So now if I want to do a lookup and see does my key key value pair actually exist? Uh, I would have to follow the pointer to the, the other thing and find what I need. And I have to do this because I want my values to be uh, fixed length. The more common approach that is more wasteful but is easier to implement, and this is what everyone typically does, is you just store redundant key 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 value pairs together in the hash table, right? And again, I don't care about ordering of the of the of the values. Or the keys in my hash table because the hash table destroys all of that. It's really about like at what point did something get inserted uh, in, in a particular spot, all right? So now if I want to know does the key exist, if it's just does this key exist, I can just you know scan through here and find the first key that, that I find. Uh, if I want to actually remove a particular key, I either need to remove all the keys or a particular key value pair. Okay. There's another trick to make this uh, unique where we'll see this on indexes where you can actually store, you know, say I want to index on, on, on a column, column foo. What they'll actually will store is column foo and the record ID as, as the key pair. And then the value is actually just the record ID as well. And that, that guarantees uniqueness of the keys. We'll, we'll cover that later. Okay? All right, so let's talk about variants of linear hashing. Uh, so, again, if you read Hacker News, one popular one that shows up once, once every so often is called Robinhood hashing. And if you know what Robinhood is, it's it's a it's an old English story about some some guy in the woods that went gangster and stole people stole money from rich people and gave it to the poor people, right? So the idea here in Robinhood hashing is that we're going to steal the slots from rich keys, and I'll define what rich means in a second, uh, and give them to poor keys, right? And so what we're going to do now is that we're, for every single uh, key value pair we have in our, in, our, in our slot array for our for hash table, 
we're also going to store the the number of positions they are away from their original idea location. Meaning, when you ha when, when you hash the key, you land some offset. Uh, that's the original location. And so you want to record how many how many steps away you are from from that. So then now when you insert a new key and there's a collision, you're going to check to see whether the uh, the incoming key is richer or poorer than the key you may replace. And if you're poor, you'll take their slot and require the rich one to, to, to move down further. So the closer you are, the richer you are. And then the idea is that over t on average, everyone be equal distance to uh, the original location. All right? So let's go back here. So we hash A. It lands at this location. Nobody's there, so we just take it. And then we store now our, our the number of jumps we are from the first position. So we're exactly where the hash function told us to go. So our, 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 our counter is 0. Same thing for B. B lands at the location by itself, so it gets 0. C comes along now. C wants to go into the same, same location where A is. But at this point, since C is 0 hops away from its original position, and A is, is 0 hops away from its original position, they're equal, so we'll leave A alone. And then C jumps down here. But now we set its, its counter to be 1, because it's one hop away where, where it should have been. D comes along. Uh, D's, D, is, uh, D is 0 hops away from C. Uh, C is one hop away. So we're going to leave uh, C alone, because again, the higher the counter, I mean, the poorer you are. Uh, so 0 is less than 1, so we're going to leave C alone. And then D goes the next slot. All right, now E comes along, right? So at the very beginning, A, uh, its, its counter is 0. A's counter is 0, so we're going to leave them alone. Then we come down here. It's E's counter is now 1. C's counter is 1. They're equal. We're going to leave them alone. But now when we get here, E's counter is now 2, because it's, it's, it's 1, 2 away from slot, jumps from where, where it should have been. But D's counter is 1. So, so we're going to go gangster on it, steal its slot, put E there with the value of 2, and then D jumps out here with the value of 2. Right? And again, the idea is that in, uh, sort of again, we're amortized to make everyone sort of equal distance to where they, where they should have been. So we don't have to do these long scans. Right? F comes along. Uh, uh, 2 is greater than 0, so we'll leave that alone. Uh, so F goes, goes here. Yes? Uh, so, so the statement is, there's a comment about there's more comment about linear probe hashing than than Robin Hood hashing. That you may end up having to doing a complete sequential scan of all the keys to find the thing you're looking for. Does anyone pre-compute an additional filter in front of the hash table, like a blue or like a bloom filter? Uh, I'm super, not everyone not everyone's going to know what bloom filter is. We'll cover that uh, in a few more classes. But figure it's like set member it's a set membership data structure. Does something exist or not? It doesn't tell you where it is. It just tells you whether, whether it exists. So you could, could you put that in front of this hash table to avoid having to do this scan? Yes, we'll see this when we do hash joins. Absolutely, yes. Is it possible to have some flopping where you take all the entries down divided by one? Is, is, sorry, have what? Sorry? Have some kind of flopping where you have the, all the entries below you. Oh, f you're saying flooding. Yeah. Could you have some flooding where you have to, you have to sort of move everything instead of cascading like yes? Yes. The answer is, well, the answer is yes. This is why in, 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 the, in the modern research literature, this is a terrible idea. You don't want to do this. I know of one database system, B, when they came and gave a talk, the guy's like, oh, yeah, we use Robinhood hashing. And we asked him why. Dave Anderson asked him why. And he said, oh, because we saw it on Hacker News. Right? Mm -hmm. This is not a, good, not a good thing to say. But yeah, in practice, this is a bad idea because actually, as you said, you're doing all this extra shuffling every time you do an insert just to make maybe reads go faster. Now, there could be a trade-off if you're very, very much read-heavy versus write-heavy, then yeah, this is a good idea. Uh, but in, in, again, in, in, in a lot of scenarios for databases, this is a bad idea. Is there a question in the back? Same question. Okay. Because right, you, especially if, if everything's in memory, because now you're doing branch merge predictions, you're doing extra copying, right? The linear hashing is so simple and so, uh, Again, it's sequential operations, which, which are great for modern superscalar CPUs. We're not going to talk about CPU caching stuff and in, in, in instructions caches as well, but like, just 
if everything's in memory, you can rip through linear hashing much faster than this thing. All right. So the one that actually is used uh, and is sort of like the sort of getting to the, the, the thing that he brought up where like, okay, if, if in the worst case scenario, I have to do a complete linear scan on everything, is there a way to avoid that? The, the Bloomfield approach is one of them, but another one is actually use essentially multiple hash tables uh, so that you're more likely to have a free slot when you land on something, when, 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 you, when you do a lookup or to, to do an insert. So this technique is called cuckoo hashing. This one is used in a lot of systems. Um, and the basic idea is that we're going to have multiple hash tables. They each have their own hash function. And every time I want, I want to do an insert, I'm going to hash the key multiple times and just pick any one that's going to have a free slot, any of the hash tables that have it with a free slot. And if you, no table has a free slot, then you're going to steal a slot from somebody. There, that key is going to come out, and then you're going to rehash it and maybe put it into another hash table. And again, you could have this cascading effect where you end up you know, inserting and stealing and deleting, you know, inserting something, stealing a slot, and then inserting that back in, all of the keys all over again, and get stuck in an infinite loop. So you have to have the checks to make sure that you, you realize you've wrapped around and, and just doing the same thing all over again. Um, and then in, so, but in, in practice, if you size the hash table large enough that you, know, you can't avoid this. Um, so the lookups and deletions are always going to be O1 because you're guaranteed to Whenever you hash, you're guaranteed to either find the key or you're not going to find the key immediately. You don't have to do that complete linear scanning. It's the, it's the puts that become expensive because right? you, may, you may have to ping pong back and forth. So this is named after the cuckoo bird, which is a type of bird where they steal the, the nests from other birds and, and lay their eggs in them. Right? So that, that's the you're sort of going back and forth. And as far as I know, the best open source implementation is actually from CMU, from, from Dave Anderson, uh, Loop Cuckoo. And they actually still maintain it. Um, so we were using we, we were using libcuckoo in, our, in the hash table that we were building, or the, the databases that we were building at CMU, uh, the older stuff. But again, as far as I know, this is the best open source one. All right, so let's see an example. So for simplicity, I'm going to show two hash tables. Uh, in libcuckoo, the default is three. Uh, again, there, there's the theoretical guarantees about whether or not you're going to have to resize based on how many hash tables hash tables you have. So the first thing we're going to do is, is do put A. So we're going to have two hash functions. Now, it's going to be the same implementation of the hash function, meaning the same XX hash or, or city hash, whatever you want to use. It's just we're going to provide a different seed value so that they're not guaranteed to, to hash the exact, exact same slots in, in the two uh, hash tables. Right? So we're going to hash A twice, uh, do a lookup to see wh whatever one has a free slot. Now, I'm showing this in parallel in practice. You would sort of do one after another in, in a single thread. But for visualization purposes, we'll just do, do it together. So this one, they both have free slots. We'll, we'll, we'll pick this one first. We put A there. They want to put B into our hash table. Same thing, we hash it. The first one here, we recognize that A is already using that location. So we're going to leave that alone. And instead, we're going to go see that on the other hash table, it's empty. So we'll go put B there. Right? Now we have C, and this is where we have, again, the, the, the sort of thrashing back and forth. We have to move, the, move values back and forth as, we, as, we, as one value steals from another value. So we're going to put C. We hash it. A is taken over there, and B is taken over there. We're going to pick B as our victim. So we're going to steal its slot, uh, and then now we've got to take B out and then put it back in the other hash table. So we're going to use the first hash function to figure out where it goes over here. But remember, in the beginning, it hashed to the same slot that A was. So B is going to steal from A now. And then now we got to put A back on the other side. So we hash it with the second hash function. It lands over here, and we have a free slot, and then we're done. Right again? Yes? What if, like, a cycle occurs? Right, so as I say, the statement is, what if there's a cycle? Yes, you have to keep track of, am I back to where I started at the beginning? Because then I know I'm stuck in the infinite loop, and then you break out. Oh, okay. And in that case, the way you would handle this is, not just for cuckoo hashing, Robin Hood hashing, and linear, linear hashing, for all these sort of static hashing schemes, when you realize you, the table is full, you're stuck in an infinite loop, you basically uh, allocate a new hash table that's double the size of the previous one. And then you delete, you, you reinsert all your keys back into the new hash table. So for Kaku, I see why that's necessary for linear hashing, but for Kaku hashing, can you just create a new hash function with a different key and just basically create the hash? So his statement is, uh, which actually might work, uh, his statement is, couldn't you just create a new hash function with the same size uh, and just insert the new one in there. It sounds like they're interdimensional inside because of the hash function. 
I think that actually might work. I don't know, though. I don't think it does it by default. I, yeah, I, it, it may work. I think it's OK. Yeah. Yes? I don't see how this works with three big pips. Because then you have two choices, and you can flip a coin. So you flip a coin. I'll flip a coin. Yeah. Doesn't matter. And hopefully, you don't run into the one that has the infinite pips. I mean, correct, yes, yeah. All right, so do get, get B, do a lookup, hash both of them. Uh, again, this is why we need to store the key value pair together, because now I'm looking for B. Uh, both slots are located or have, are occupied, but this is the one that I, that I actually want. And I'm done. Yes? What if you are going to look up A here? This question is, what if I'm going to look up A? Yeah, A points to the original, like the hash table one, the B location. Like uh, job, uh, job search hash. The uh, A ha yeah, hashes. I mean, going back up here, so you're saying, a hashes these two locations, OK? So now down here, after I've done the, 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 the movement back and forth, A is over here. But the first hash function would, would hash here. What's the issue? Uh, okay. Again, we, we would know we're looking for A. We, we would, the first hash function would, would land us here. We would see we have the original key there. So we say, oh, is A equal, equal to B? No, this is not what I want. A would hash over here. Uh, a equals A, so this is what we want. Now, if there was something else in this slot here, then we would know that point that, like, since A wasn't here, and then the key that's occupied here isn't A either, we know that A doesn't exist. So we can stop. Yes? This question is, um, if you create a new table in, in his proposal, isn't that, wouldn't that be considered a... Uh, it's not his any proposal, like even for linear programming. When you create a new table, it's not his proposal. So his statement is, uh, his statement is, wouldn't this make it, if once the, once the hash table is full, if you're going to uh, create a whole other hash table and then just load it back up with the old contents, isn't that considered dynamic? I mean, it's not doing it incrementally, right? So, I mean, the answer is yes. Yeah. At a high level, yes. Is, is it dynamic enough that like, it can out make a new one? Yes, but it's like a, it's like a coarse grained approach. It's like I allocated the whole new thing, right? Like, uh, how do I say this? If my car catches on fire, and the only thing that's still, that I can save out of it is like the, the cup holders, and I build a new car and I put those old cup holders in it, is, this, is it the same car? <laughs> right? <laughs> it's basically what you're, what you're proposing. I mean, there's this, there's the, um, oh, there's this old Greek, Greek, uh, yeah, thing. There's, there's like, there's the, there's the ship thing in Greek mythology. If like, if I have a ship and I've replaced every single piece in it, right, because it's over the years, is it still the same ship? At a high level, sure, it's a ship, but is it exactly the same one? Well, the, the bits and pieces are different. So that's basically what he's saying there. The car metaphor is, is, is the ship one's better than the car one, but. <laughs> Okay, cool. Yes? Right. In general, are we going to assume uh, like that the keys and values are just like blindly non-copyable anywhere? Like in C++, you can't make that assumption. But like with respect to like the database system, is that something that we'll, we'll generally be okay with? So his, his, his statement or the question is, uh, can we assume that the, the bytes for the key and values are non-copyable where that's not the case always in C++? Uh, I mean, yeah, like it's, it's just a bunch of bytes. We can do whatever we want with it, right? So yeah. Yes? So the statement is, what would be the behavior with, with, with non-unique keys, with B? Uh, so you could do the thing I mentioned before, where like you actually store the, you could store the record ID as part of the key, and then get, therefore it's, it is a unique key. Uh, actually, for hash tables, that won't exactly work, because uh, yeah, hash tables that won't work because, like, if I'm trying to find the 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 record that has this key, if I already had the record ID, then I wouldn't need the hash table, right? So you can do that trick in B plus trees. You can't do that here. Uh, you'd basically have to have again an auxiliary data structure that that like the value would then point to to that, and then you can look in there the thing you're looking for. It's another abstraction layer. 
we'll talk about, so the, the thing I was mentioning before where you couldn't put the record ID in there. B plus trees are gonna allow you to do prefix searches, meaning like I only have the first portion of the key, not the whole thing. And that's why you can pack the record ID and get that unique trick. You can't do that in, in a hash table because you hash the whole thing. So if I only have portion of the key, then it's not the same key. So I misspoke on that one. So you would use the pointer thing that I said before. Okay. So uh, the, 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 all these previous hash tables required us to know the number of elements that we want to store ahead of time. Again, in the case of cuckoo hashing, there's no guarantee that I'm going to have exactly uh, complete occupation of, of the table, right? Because I'm way I'm doing this, this, this movement back and forth, but at least in linear probe hashing, uh, if all the slots are full, then the table is full. And I, I have to basically uh, build a whole new one. And again, the, the standard practice is to, to build a new hash table that's two X the size of the original one, right? That's what I was saying before that the space complexity isn't always just N. It could, you know, it could, it could be something much larger than that. Um, cause you want to allocate something that's has enough free space to allocate certain, uh, to, to handle, uh, to handle a certain amount of growth. So the dynamic hash tables that we're talking about are going to be able to resize themselves on demand and still be the same hash table, uh, without having to alloc reallocate everything all, all, all over again. So the most common one is called chain hashing. This is sometimes called bucketed hash tables. Uh, this is, this is usually what people are most familiar with when we talk about hash tables. Uh, this is what you get, I think, when you get Java's hash map class. This is the way, this is what they implement underneath the covers. And the idea is that the, the, the slot array in our hash table is going to now point to these buckets that are going to have the key value pairs. And we can keep extending the, this, this, this bucket chain for a given slot in our, our hash table as we add new elements. And we're just going to do a linear search in the buckets to find the key value pair that, that we're looking for, right? So it's a way to resolve collisions is that if you map hash to the same thing, then we just keep appending you to the list. So you sort of think of this as ways like you're partitioning the linear probe hashing table that we talked about before into the, these smaller buckets so that the linear search portion is, uh, is, you know, is not as, you're not, you're not to scan the, the entire uh, table. It's sort of generalized to just what's in your bucket, right? So if we go, our hash table now looks like this. So we have our bucket pointers. And this would be equivalent to the hash array that, that we talked about before. And then we have our buckets that are stored somewhere else. So now when I, when I want to do a lookup uh, into insert A, I would hash it mod n by the number of bucket pointers that I have. That gives me just some, some offset here. And then that's going to have a pointer to the starting location of the first entry in the bucket chain for this, this, this slot. I, and I find the first, first empty spot, and I, I put A there. Same thing for B, I hash it, it takes me to this top bucket chain up here, and I find the first slot and I, I store my data. So now if I have C, uh, C would take me to the starting point of A, just like before, I check to see whether the, key, the space is occupied, it is, so I jump down to the next one, I store C there. But now if I want to store D, uh, again, I land to the first, first bucket in my chain, both A and C are occupied, so instead now I'm gonna allocate a new, new bucket where it's, you know, now it's going to have free spots, and I can put D there. Yes? The size of the bucket is uh, chosen by us, right? The question is the size of the bucket is chosen by us, us being the data developers? Yes. yes. So it, in this case, it's arbitrarily chosen. Right? Yeah, so in this case, I'm showing, yeah, for, for all these examples, because I have to fit it on the slides, yeah. two. Okay. In practice, it's going to be the page size if it's backed by disk. Uh, if it's in memory, you, you might do one megabyte or something larger. Right, so now I want to do E, same thing. I, I look at AC, it's empty, and then I can go to DE. So this is a good example where the thing you said before, I can maintain in the bucket pointer table up here, I could have a filter that says, does the key I'm looking for actually even exist in this bucket chain? And then if, if not, then I would know I, I don't even need to bother go, go looking. Right, that's, that's a very common optimization, yes? In practice, it would still make sense to reallocate the entire hash table after a while, right? Because if it grows too, too large, and you So the statement is, uh, even though this thing can, can grow dynamically, if everything hashes to the same thing, then this, this bucket chain could grow super, super long. And, and then like now you have to do linear scan on that. I mean, not even if it's just to the same bucket. If it's just like initially you have like 100 elements and then you have like 10,000, then each of the buckets is going to have like a very long range of bit length. And then if you increase the number of bucket pointers, you can increase like the length of the 
yeah, so this one here, like, so statement is like, if I don't choose the right number of buckets, bucket pointers ahead of time, then like they may all go to the same thing. And after inserting a bunch of stuff, this may get too big. And it may be the case I want to then resize this, right? And th this is what the other two schemes will look at when you handle this for us. Yeah. Yes. Sort of uh, to the same point, if this continues to elongate uh, to the same like uh, hash value, can't we? Is there any scheme in which we just put it in the next slot because that's empty? Or so the statement is, 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 if this thing goes arbitrarily long, yeah. is there any way we could say, all right, I want to I want to install F, yeah. but instead of putting it here, put it down here? Correct. But then how would I know it's there? Yeah, I mean, you have to account for that. Like, how? I don't know. I have an additional source. <laughs> no, no, so, how? How would you do it? I guess you'd have to, again, we may research the entire thing, right? So it's not going to Yeah, so, so think about it. So, so his statement is, I want to put F here, right? Actually, F does go here, right? <laughs> but let's say F actually, F actually mapped here, right? And his statement is, okay, well, if this thing goes too long, maybe I want to put F here. And then I, my pushback is, how would you actually find it? So you have two ways. One is, I would know that if I reach the end of this thing when I look for F and it's not there, I should go check the next one. Yeah. But like, that, just, that sucks for everything else, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, sucks for F as well. It sucks for F as well, right? Because mm -hmm. now you know, do this look up. Right. Uh, the uh, the other issue, the other solution is actually to have a, a sort of auxiliary data structure up here that says, "Oh, by the way, if you're looking for F, go here, not here." Right. What would what would be that auxiliary data structure? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a hash table. Yeah. Right. So you have another hash table for your hash table. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so my, I guess my question is, can you like reallocate memory so that this sort of bottom disappears and goes there? If this thing disappears and goes here, yeah, adds an additional bucket, I guess. Uh, well, you're actually getting to the to to linear hashing. We'll get that. We'll get that in a second. Yes, we can do this incrementally. Yes. Is the point of using buckets instead of just a linked list just to use the console access? Is it sorry, say, say it again. Uh, of using buckets instead of just a console uh, this list to use the console linked access? Or? Uh, are, are sorry, are these going to be sequential in memory or instead of a linked list with arbitrary locations or? Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. So, 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 within a bucket itself, are these just sequential and not a linked list? Yes. Yes, so his so statement is um, the, again, if, if this is backed by disk, we, we don't want to bucket size one because it's one eight kilobyte fetch to go get one slot. We want to pack this as much as together so we do much, much, as much sequential access as possible. So that, that's the whole point of this, yes. Yes? So how is this different? Uh, this kind of sounds similar to like a separate link list added to a non-use So the so statement is, uh, this sounds very similar to the, the, the separate link list you'd maintain for the non-unique uh, non values, yes. Or non-unique keys, yes. Same thing. All right. So 20 minutes ago, let's go to the two harder, the most hardest data structures, right? It's always a good time. All right. So extendable hashing is going to be, I mean, you guys are sort of pecking around the edges. You're getting to the solution. I, I want to show you what it is. Uh, the, the extendable hashing is, is an extension to uh, chain hashing where we're going to be able to split buckets instead of, instead of letting the link list grow forever, which is the solution he was trying to deal with. The key about this, though, is that now in our, in our, our bucket pointer slot array, that the, the pointers can point to this, uh, different locations in that, that array can point to the same buckets, even though the hash values may actually be different. And then we're going to reshuffle and reorganize the, the bucket entries anytime we have a split, and by expanding the number of bits we're going to look at in our hash values. And so the advantage we're going to get from this is that we can reorganize the hash table, but the data movement is just localized to the part of the chains or the part of the, the hash table that actually has to get split. We'll leave everything else where, 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 where it's located originally without having to move it at all. That's why this is better than he would, about like the having to you know, create a new whole hash table that's double the size of the previous one and load everything back in. We have to move data, but we only have to move data that, uh, for just a small portion of it. All right, so the way it's going to work is these are our bucket pointers here. And we're going to have this thing called a global counter that's going to tell us the number of bits we have to look at in our 
or hash, hash value for a given key. And then for every single bucket chain, they're going to have a, a local, local bit counter. Now we need, th this is just for the local one. You actually don't need to really maintain. This is for, just for illustrative purposes. We, de we, need the, we need the global one. All right, so the, the, you can think of the local one, it's going to tell us the number of bits we have to look at into our, our hash value here. All right, so get this is the binary representation of what the hash is. So in the case of the first, first one here, we only look at the first bit because that the local value is one. So when we just look at the first bit, these two locations in the slot array map to the same bucket. So no matter you have, if the hash values are, are different, as long as those, that first bit is zero, then we know we go to this first bucket here. For these other two uh, buckets down here, we look at two bits, right? The local bits counters are set to two. So we have one zero, we'll go to this bucket here, and one one, go to this bucket down here, All right? So say I want to do a get, get a look up on A. I would look at my global counter. It says I want to look at two bits. So when I look at the first two bits of the, of the hash value on that key, uh, that would take me to here, and then that would jump to that, that bucket right there. That has what I want, All right? Now I want to do a put on B. Again, same thing. I look at the first two bits because that's what my global counter says. Then I map to this uh, location in my uh, bucket pointer array. I jump to that bucket, find the first free slot at the bottom, and I insert it, and I'm done. Now I'm going to do a put in C. Same thing. Look at the first two bits. That maps to here, that, which then takes me to this bucket. But now this bucket is full. So instead of doing what I did in chain hashing, where I just extend the, 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 the length list of, of buckets over and over, I'm going to split this bucket. And I'm going to now increase my uh, global counter to three, because I've, I've sort of, this, this, I, I, you know, I need to look at more bits to do the split. And then I'm going to extend or double the size of my, 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 my pointer array here. Uh, and now I'm going to include, keep track of three bits. But in some of, the, some of the buckets, I only need to look at one bit. Some of the buckets, I need to look at two bits. Other buckets, I look at, uh, at, at three bits. So I'm going to create a new, bu new bucket here, and I'm going to rehash the keys that were in the original bucket, and some will stay in the original bucket, and some will go to a new one, right? Based on the, looking at the three bits, instead of before we were looking at only at two, right? So now I, I got to figure out how to update all the values in this this my array here. So I want to look at the first bits for the ones that start with zero, and so all of these are going to map to that same bucket at the top. When I look at two bits, that's going to take me down to the bottom. And then for the three bits, I'll have one go to the old original bucket, and then one will go to the new bucket. Yes? Uh, can we optimize so that when we split the buckets, they're like half entered in the first one, half entered in the second? Like, as opposed to like just taking care of three bits or four bits, can we like take, like, let's say numbers are like five, seven bits, uh, like so they're similar for five, seven bits, then just check. So his statement is, uh, could you, Instead of looking at exactly the number of bits you need to look at for the, in, that it's defined by the local counter, because you possibly look at more so you get more balanced buckets, yeah. you can do that, but you have to update this. You have to make this larger. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, you could do that. Yes? What's your plan if you have a lot of keys in that? I mean, Doing what, this or what he proposed? Uh, no, 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 I mean the expense of all the hashes. Because now, when it, if, if, to, if I had, say, say this thing was getting full and just kept growing, 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 then it's basically a linear search to go find the key that I want, right? So if I split it up now, then I'm getting the benefit of the hash table where it's like a divide and conquer approach. I do the hash, I jump to the location that has the data that I want, and it's less likely I do a linear scan. But the key is that I only have to move these two guys, these two pages around, two buckets. I didn't have to touch the ones at the top and the bottom. So we are basically uh, assigning more buckets to the hot spots of the key. Yes, we're assigning, we're, we're, we're assigning more buckets to the hot portion of the key uh, so that they're they're split up more more evenly. Yes. Yes. So how do you go from the global to the local mapping again? The question is, how do you go from the global to the local mapping? Yeah, like the how do you know, like for example, like the, the ones that start with zero have to go to the first one, and the ones that start with zero. So the question is, how do I know that the ones that start with zero have to go to the first one? So, I mean, it's really when you come back here, you would, you know you're splitting on this, uh, and you know this one it, it deals with uh, two. So you would increment to, that to three. So you know that you would have to look at, uh, find all the ones where the, the three are different, and then you leave all the ones where the one, one the first bit was alone. You at least let them map to the old one. Okay, for example, how do you know one zero zero maps to the one that was the first two bits? 
this question is how do you know that one zero zero maps to the one that points to the first bit? Uh, like, I'm oh, sorry, go back here. So the question is, how did you know that 100 maps to that? Because when, like, I'm showing this early pre-populated, right? But it, it's like, think of, I start from empty, and as I insert it, I'm doing the bookkeeping to keep track of, like, where things are actually going. Again, like, it's pre, think from, start from nothing, and as you build it up, then you update the counters, and you know where things go. Yes? The correct statement is, what if, what if I double the size of the full bucket and then then do what, sorry? Basically, you just pass locally, like have a secondary attach function that perform on that. So the statement is, what if you just had a, basically a hash table hierarchy, like yeah. within the hash table, within the bucket, it's another hash table. Yeah. Uh, it seems to be structurally simpler than this. I mean, or, or it's performing another hash to a secondary. No, well... Yeah, so the statement is like, again, it's, at a high level, is it the same? Yes. Uh, but, it, but, but at what point do you stop, right? Like, you're saying, okay, I, like, my hash table, my bucket is too large, so I'll build another hash table. But what if you still have a hotspot? Do you build another hash table? Yeah, I got you. This thing handles that for you. Yeah. Yeah. It's the, uh, Charlie's statement is, is, uh, if you squint, this looks like the perfect hashing scheme from the beginning. Question over here. Yes. When do you use the local uh, counter? The local counter is just for illustration, for, for bookkeeping. You would know. You would know this. You would have. You would have this metadata over here. Okay. All right. Let, let me get through the last one, uh, linear hashing, because uh, this, this is another approach. And to me, I think this one is uh, is even more complicated, but I think it's super clever. All right. So the the hash table is going to maintain this, this pointer, this cursor, that's going to keep track of what's the next bucket I want to split. And then when any, bu when any bucket overflows, I'm going to split whatever that, buck that pointer points to, even if it's not the one that overflowed. And then, and then I'll just keep it doing, extending the, the hash chain. And the idea is that we want to, again, to, to sort of smoothly grow the, the size of the hash table over time We'll eventually get to the hot, hot, hot uh, bucket and split that. But the idea is that like, we want to grow it so that like we can accommodate things uh, growth in the future, right? The extendable hash table only splits the one that, that fills up right right away. Uh, but the idea is that I can maybe split other ones uh, in preparation of them becoming the hot spot in, in the future, right? So let's look like this. So we have our our, our slot array. We have all our buckets. And again, we're going to start off with it. With the, it's basically going to be a chain hash table where we can extend these buckets out, right? But when we overflow, we're going to have this pointer that tells us which one we should actually split. So we have a split pointer here that points to slot zero. So the the hash key is going to be uh, it'll be two hashes. Will be the key mod mod number n. We'll start off with that. So say I want to get six, it takes me here. I hash it by the first hash function. That takes me to this location, and and I'm done, All right? I'm going to put 17. 17 goes in this bucket, but it's full. So unlike in extendable hashing, where I would split it immediately, I'm going to extend it, allow myself to build a new overflow bucket, and then I'm going to split whatever the, the split pointer points at. So in this case here, it points at uh, the top one, zero. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and split this. So I'm just going to add one new entry in my slot array and a new hash function here. That, well, now it's mod 2n. So I know that if anything is... Uh, below below the old the old slot array, I want to use two n. Otherwise, above it, I'll just use n, and then I'll rehash the keys that are in my my split bucket that I'm splitting, um, and then rebalance that that portion there. And then I move the split pointer down by one. Let me let me keep going. Sorry. So then the I want to get twenty. So again, at this point here, I know that uh, that the, the hash value for this one it would be well mod by four. So that takes us to the location that we want right there. That's fine. Uh, so we get there. If I want to do a lookup on, uh, sorry, take it back. I would look here, recognize that it is uh, above my split pointer. So therefore, I don't want to use the first hash function. I would use the second one, because then that'll take me to the location that I want down below. 
right? So now if I say I do another a get like this, the get is below the split pointer uh, or at the split pointer, so therefore I could use the original hash function. So I'll keep doing this, I'll keep inserting, uh, uh, keep splitting my, my, my buckets until the split pointer moves down, then I'll eventually split the one that, that overflowed. Yes? Uh, when you get the second hash, shouldn't you expand the array like from 4 to 8? Why you change the hash? Yeah, so his statement is, I, I, mean, I, I, I increased the size of the hash, the slot array by 1. In practice, you would double the size and allocate a new one, right? In, in anticipation of splitting everything. Can you repeat, how would you know that for, to get when you would use the second hash instead of the so, so his question is, how, at this point, when I do get 20, how do, I need, how do I know I need to use the first hash function, not the second one? Because I have this marker here, this water line that says where the split pointer is. Anything above that, I've already split, so therefore I need to use the second hash function. Anything at that line or below it, I can use the first hash function. Within, you know, with, within you know, obviously here. What would be a third hash function if the one is also overflow? So the question is, what would be the third hash function I would use? Uh, it would be mod 4n. Yes. But eight is still on bucket zero. Eight. Eight. So is eight is still on bucket zero. Yes. Uh, but hash when I when I did the split, I rehashed everything with this. Oh, so when you divide by two, then it still goes. It still goes. Still stay at the same spot. Yes. Yes. So sorry, why did you add the four again? So so the question is, why did I add the four? Because this thing got overflowed. So whatever the split pointer points at, I'm going to add a new. I'm going to split the bucket that it points at, even though it's not the one that overflowed. Because the idea is that eventually, I'll, I'll get to it, right? And then when you split the overflow bucket, that's it's basically a kind of It's it's basically planning for the future. Yes, like if this thing's super hot and keep, that, that 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 second buck, you know, bucket chain is super hot and I keep overflowing, eventually the split pointer will get to it. The statement is, why not use extensible hashing? I mean, this is a different approach, a different way to solve the problem. Is this better than extensible This question is, is this better than extensible hashing? It's easier to code. Yeah, yeah this, is the, wait, sorry, this is easier to hoge? Right, extensible hash, hashing is easier to code. No, this is easier to code. He said this is easier to code. <laughs> Potentially, yes. Yeah, this is easier to code. Yeah, this is this is easier to code. Potentially, yes. Yes. If one overflow, would you also need to hash the zero bucket again? With the key so the statement is if uh, if one overflowed again, would I would I have to rehash zero? No. If one overflowed right now, then uh, I would split whatever the split pointer points at. So it points at one. I would split that, then re rehash everything with mod two n. Right, and then if it overflows again after that, the split pointer would move down to two, and I would split two. And I just extend this ha hashing. And if it keeps overflowing, I'll eventually come back around, right? And then I'll, I'll, get, I'll get to it again. As he said, it's like, sort of like preparing for the future. Yes? So when you say rehash everything, you're just saying rehash everything in the bucket, the, in the chain, the, the split pointer. Yes, yeah, so it's the same as when I say rehash everything, it's like whatever the split pointer is pointing at, you rehash it with the new hash function. And it decides do I, go in the old, do I stay in the old bucket or go to the new bucket? Yes? Uh, his question is, is n supposed to be 4 in this example? Uh, yeah, because otherwise your hash, the second hash is you're like modding by 8. So is there supposed to be supposed to like double in terms of hash function? Yeah, so his statement is, yeah. So it, for illustrative purposes, when I split and I add a new hash function, I double the size of this. Oh, okay. I, I, I run out of space. So I, yeah, for, I try to simplify it. But yes, you're right. You would double the size. You would have 8 slots, not 4, or not, not 5. All right, so the, in practice, uh, as far as I know, most people don't implement extendable hashing or linear hashing. They do the linear probe hashing, uh, and they just, you pay the penalty to double the size. So the magic is, can you set the, the original n value to be good enough to, to, uh, so you don't have to you know, rebuild the whole hash table? And then when we talk about query optimization, this is something that Dave is going to try to figure out for you automatically, based on, like, if you're using it for joins, 
the number of keys you're going to have to put in it. Right, so, so you avoid that, uh, having to reboot everything. Yes? Chain hashing is still common practice for uh, for indexes. For for doing joins, it's typically going to be the linear probe hashing. Yes. Is, her statement is: uh, Every time I split, do I get a new hash function? Again, like it's the same hash function implementation, so it's, it's still SED hash, but I'm giving it a different seed, so that it does it. It doesn't get. It's not guaranteed to, to jump to a different location. Sorry, it's not. It's it's, it's guaranteed to jump to a different. Well, not guaranteed. It's it's not always going to jump to the same location. Hash one and two have different seeds. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to skip deletes because that's a whole other uh, hornet's nest. Um, all right. So let's finish up. So hash tables are fast data structures. They're going to provide us O1 lookups. Again, as I said, linear probe hashing is probably the most common one for databases, after, followed by the, ch the, the, the chained hashing. And again, there's a trade-off between speed and flexibility and not having to latch the whole data structure and then rebuild it if you run out of space. So the hash tables, though, they can use them for indexes. They're not going to be the most common data structure. Uh, and I've already said what the most common data structure is going to be is going to be B, B plus trees. Or the various variants of them, right? Sometimes you see in the literature it say B trees uh, in databases. Postgres calls it a B tree. In, in practice, it's always going to be a B plus tree. Again, and this is the greatest data structure of all time. I don't care about splay trees. I don't care about other things. It's this one. Okay. Hit it. Day cold, taking this toll. I got a pack of zigs, but ain't got nothing to roll. Hit the bus spot, let me cop a duck, show some love. We for 50, is you with me? What I'm speaking of? I'm in the studio at nine, so it's song. And I'm not leaving till I'm finished with my next song. Fucking with that dope, you know it make my legs flow. Just grab a double deuce or two and then I'm good to go. Yo, I get this shit done and get it over with. Cause the whole world's waiting for another Tears Town Street sound. Clown a motherfucker if you label me a fake. I'm like a cobra and I'm down with the super snake.